Awesome. All right, here we go. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23. And I'm calling this message, Don't Just Go Through the Motions. <laughs> Don't just go through the motions. Let's see how that fits into these verses. But first, you know, uh, how many of you like those cooking shows? Any, anybody here like those? Cook those are fun to watch, aren't they? A couple of my favorites is, I like Chopped. You like Chopped? Those are, those, those are good chefs, too. But one by one, they get eliminated until they, they come up with the best one. Here, how about this one? You like this one? Uh, uh, it's called uh, Master Chef. You like Master Chef? That's where regular home cooks, okay, uh, 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 they see if they can make it to the top where they become the America's next Master Chef. I think that's kind of cool. I enjoy watching those shows. But if you're like me, you've got to be careful. Because when I watch those shows, oh, there's somebody, what happens? You get hungry when you watch those shows. So be careful. I noticed uh, in, on one of the shows that I was watching, uh, there's one judge, he's pretty, pretty rough and sometimes kind of rude. Uh, but anyway, he ended up telling several of the people that had cooked on this one particular show's contest. Uh, he said something like this. Where is the star of the plate? You missed the point. All I'm tasting is a side dish. Ever, ever, ever hear any, anybody say something like that, you know? Where, where, where's, the, where's the star of the plate? And I thought, oh, well, that's kind of interesting. Where's the star of the plate? Because I was thinking to myself, we can do that with God sometimes. We can do that with our faith. So that all of a sudden, what our faith becomes is some kind of a, you know, routine. You know? We're just going through the motions. And I think maybe the Holy Spirit would tap us on the shoulder at that point, and not in a mean but a loving way, not to condemn, but to encourage us and say, where's the star of the plate, so to speak? You know what that's like sometimes when uh, all you're sadly left with is only religious motions? I mean, imagine Jesus coming to a church. He doesn't find real faith. In fact, at, at, towards the end of the book of Luke, I think it's Luke uh, chapter 18, if I'm not mistaken. Jesus says words to the effect, uh, when I return, will I find any faith on the earth? What a question. Is there going to be any? He's, it's like he's looking for it. Is there any faith around here? Anybody anybody's here still believe in God, you know, kind of a thing? So imagine Jesus coming to a church and not finding true faith. But what he's finding is a lot of people going through the motions, just a lot of uh, religious rigmarole, a lot of rituals, activities, maybe even a lot of activities. But if those activities are not based upon faith, then the Holy Spirit could ask, where's the star of the plate? Where's the star of your faith? That's what the Apostle Paul is worried about to the Colossian church. Have they lost sight of who Christ is? I mean, the first two chapters give us so strongly who Jesus is. He's God come in the flesh. But he's worried about them, and he gives to them really strong words. And we're going to hear him speak those words today. He tells them, you know, virtually, if you miss Christ, you've missed everything. You missed the whole boat. You missed your prize. You, you missed a reward. You've been cheated kind of a thing. And that first century world was really something. So let's think about the first century world for a moment, especially in Colossae, where a lot of uh, Roman retirees had gone. Uh, Colossae was a real hodgepodge of different kinds of faiths and religions. Uh, what they had there was they had some Jewish, they had... Uh, some Gentiles worshiping many gods. They had all the Greek influences. They had the various philosophies of Socrates and Plato, as well as many Eastern beliefs. I think to myself, wait a minute. That's the world today. <laughs> I'm becoming more and more so. For me, here's where it hits home. That sadly, you can lose Christ as your all in all, but still continue in some kind of a forward momentum in just the motions. When somebody's praying, you know, you're just kind of like, oh, okay, are they almost done yet? Or, 
When somebody's preaching, you hear the word of God, but you're not receiving it as the word of God. You're receiving it just as words and not God speaking to me right now. That's like going through the motions. Look, look this can happen to all of us. You know, it's happened to me. Sometimes you're there at church and, and you're thinking, uh, like, I wonder right now, maybe some, some of you are thinking about dinner tonight or thinking about the, uh, you know, the hospitality after and the, the meal we're going to have and sit down together. Maybe, I don't know, maybe somebody here is playing golf or thinking about, thinking through some kind of, you know, work problem or wishing they had more sleep. You know, it'd be kind of interesting to come to the end of a service and find out where everybody's really been. <laughs> You know, if they've been here or, or not, that'd be kind of fun to see. And that's where it hits home. So let's do this. Let's pray. Then let's read a few of our verses and see what God might say to us today. Let's pray. Father, let's really pray. <laughs> not a routine, but let's connect with the Lord God Almighty. Heavenly Father, we've come here to call upon you. Maybe we haven't talked to you for a while. Maybe it's been a few days or maybe even longer. So perhaps the first thing we should do is just ask that you forgive us for maybe forgetting you for a little bit. And I ask Lord God right now that what we would experience as a church family is really hearing from you. In fact, help me to get out of the way, Lord so that you can speak to us through your word. I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this opportunity, Lord. And I hope, Father, that none of us let it go to waste. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody says? Amen. All right. Colossians chapter 2. I'm just going to read verses 16 to 19 to get us going. And then, Lord willing, we'll finish up the chapter. Paul the Apostle writes, So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffing up his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, that's Christ, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. I read those verses and I just rejoice Here's what I rejoice about. What tremendous freedom we have in Christ. You know, dietary restrictions. If you want, if you want to, would you like to have bacon on that sandwich? <laughs> Go for it. I was hearing somebody say, uh, I think it was some comedian, he was talking about a doctor he had heard who said that, uh, uh, that bacon is really, really bad for you. How many know bacon is really, really bad for you? Okay, how many of you know that it's really, really tasty, though? Okay. So he says, uh, for every a piece of bacon you eat, you knock 10 minutes off of your life. And this comedian said, if that were true, I would have died in the 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> so we have tremendous freedom in Christ. Don't let anybody judge you in regards to these things. Instead of you better not do this or you better be careful of that or watch out not to go here or watch out not to go there. Instead, in our faith, what we have is it's almost like a celebration. Look at all the things you get to do that you are unable to do apart from Christ. Now you get to love the Lord your God. Now you get to walk humbly with Him. Now you get to bless as many people as you can along the way because heaven is your home. Somebody might say, oh yeah, well, look, uh, if we're going to live, you know, following Christ and we've got all this freedom. I mean, are you sure that's okay? You know, how many were raised in kind of pretty strict, uh, pretty strict church, uh, church uh, atmosphere, you know? 
All right, let me just go ahead and ask, how many did not eat meat on Fridays? Is it, we got a few of us. <laughs> okay, we had some kind of thought that maybe that would make us closer to God or not, you know. Well, okay. <laughs> we'll just kind of leave that there. <laughs> Somebody might say, well, what am I going to get from God in return? As you love Him, as you walk humbly with Him. Well, this is what you get in return. He promises to take care of you. The God of the universe promises you that he's going to take that's pretty cool isn't it that he's going to take care of you that he will not leave you ever that he will give you every provision and every power necessary in order to complete what it is that he calls you to do now look even knowing this as we do i see a lot of you know, people are in agreement with this. Even knowing these things, it is easy for us to slip from the joy of relationship with God to the place of drudgery, of keeping oneself in a continued religious duty and pointing out when other people don't. And so, the first word in our verses today, in verse 16, what's the first word in verse 16? So. so. <laughs> That's a very, very important so. It's almost like a because. That word so at the start of verse 16 means so all you folks who understand who Christ is. As we've already said, God come in the flesh. And what He has done for us on the cross of Calvary. He paid the price for your sins and mine. He paid our admission into heaven. He purchased us with his own blood. So, because you understand that, verse 16 follows, let no one judge you that some foods are more holy than others, or in what you drink, or regarding a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath. This is kind of interesting that he hits those three. And those are actually three categories. So when he says festival, he's talking about some yearly feast day that is necessary for you to keep. When he says new moon, he is talking about some monthly obligation that you are entitled to keep. And when he says Sabbaths, he is talking about weekly observances or weekly requirements. Now, the first thing that I think about when I think about something yearly, something monthly, something weekly, the first thing I think about is the Old Testament and the laws of Moses. Somebody might say, hey, aren't those things in the Bible that you have to keep those feast days? You got to keep those months, new moons. You got to keep those Sabbaths. Otherwise, you're out. Isn't it say that? Why would that be in the Bible? Why are they there? Paul the Apostle, watch how logical he is because he knows somebody might ask that. So he answers it in verse 17. He says these things, these festivals, these new moons, these Sabbaths, verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. This is really going to begin to explain a lot for, for a bunch of us. Now, uh, let me say that there are some folks who say, you really need to meet on Saturday, and Saturday only, and that's the day, right? So you think, oh my gosh, they're so strong about it. Even Christ, some Christian faiths, right? They say, you got to meet on Saturday, and that, that, that shows that you're, you're more, more holy than others who, who don't meet on that. It's totally false. You say, well, why is that? Because it's only a shadow. A shadow? What do you mean it's only a shadow? It speaks of something greater. It was almost like a marker, like a marker in a book that holds a place, and that place is Christ. And so all these things that we're looking at, foods and drinks and religious days, they were shadows or illustrations or markers during the year. But now we have Jesus. They were all pointing to him. They all show about him. Look, I love going through the Old Testament because I go, wow, here's another illustration of what Jesus looks like. 
Uh, here's another picture of what he looks like. Here's another type of what Christ looks like. And all the feast days and the drinks and all that. And how they decorated and what they observed and what they said. It all spoke of him. I was trying to think of a good illustration of how I might get this across. So who here likes In-N-Out Burger? Uh, okay, all right, it's all of us. Anybody here ever had a 4 by 4 Oh, look at that, okay. Have you eaten more than that? Six by six, okay, four by four. Four by four is the winner today. Oh my gosh, or I died shortly after, huh? <laughs> in and out burger, when you, you go ahead and make your order, you pay, then you come to the window and you see the gals and they're doing the fry, they're making the fries, you know? You know? Great, you know, just your mouth is beginning to water. You get to the thing and the lady says, one of the first things she says to her, are you going to be eating this in your car? Right? Now, what self-respecting person would not? How can you wait to get home before you dig into the fries at least? So you always go, yes. <laughs> are you nuts? Of course I'm going to eat these as soon as I get my hands on them. So she gives you a piece of paper that you're supposed to put on your lap, right? And the piece of paper has a picture on it. And the picture that the paper has is of a hamburger. It's not the hamburger you ordered, but it's a pretty good likeness of the hamburger you're about to eat. So what if all of a sudden you said to the gal, after she gave you that paper with a picture of the burger on it, oh, thank you for the picture of the burger. I'll just eat this. Thank you very much. It's the same thing. I'll just involve myself in this routine. I'll just stroke tally these routines that I'm doing. I'll stroke tally these prayers. Maybe if I'll say a lot of words, then God will hear me. Maybe if through repetition of a lot of words, God will hear me. No heart in it. I'm just stroke tallying. <laughs> and I'm thinking that God's going to hear me that way or respond to me that way because I somehow did something that separates me from everybody else. But here's the problem. All the things you do religiously are external and they don't speak of your heart. And God is always after the heart. Here's another example. Just suppose, men, I don't recommend this, but just suppose in your relationship with your wife, every morning when you got up before you left to go to work, you read a prepared statement to your wife. And actually, actually, you didn't even read it to her. You read it to a picture of her. So your wife's in the house someday, you know, in the morning. And you have this prepared statement. The statement goes something like this. Good morning, wife. I love you. I'm glad to be married to you. Uh, may your day be filled with goodness and sunshine. Now I'm going to work to provide for our family. I'll come back afterwards. Be with you once again. I love you. Bye. That's just a routine. That's just a ritual. What if I sang it? Would that make it better? Good morning, wife. I love you. I'm glad to be married to you. Okay. <laughs> what if I made it sound holy? Which I don't know if I have a holy voice here, but may your day be filled with goodness and sunshine. Now I'm going to work and I will come back to thee. Would that help? Okay, what do you think your wife would do if she saw you doing that? See, she'd be absolutely sure then that you had totally lost it. You'd gone off the deep end. She would say, there's something seriously wrong with you. It would look as though I were having a relationship with the routine rather than a relationship with my wife. So what must it be like for God? When he just sees us going through the motions. Wouldn't it be like he'd be like, I'm over here. <laughs> and there you'd be like, you know. And he'd be like, hey, hey, over here. Same kind of deal. Christians have freedom. But you don't use that freedom to like put yourself to sleep, you know, in the things of God. You have freedom to have a kosher diet. Observe it if you want. Great. Be, become a uh, vegetarian if you'd like. I'll pray for you. You can observe a Sabbath day or not. It's, it makes no difference. Some people think one day is 
more holy than another and this day is hey to me like the apostle paul says every day is the lord's day every day belongs to him i belong to him there's nothing wrong with those things as long as you understand that they were just shadows they were a way to keep us in touch with the one that was coming. But the one that is coming is already here. And I don't need those shadows anymore. Look, even through the Old Testament, there's a number of places where God speaks to his people. And he tells them a number of times, don't just go through the motions. I hate your routines. Let me give you an example. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. This is the Lord speaking through the prophet Isaiah. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Bring me no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I can endure it no longer. Wow, is that pretty strong? No wonder, uh, no wonder the Apostle Paul is coming off so strong here. Look, do you think that God is ever fooled by religious motions? You think God will ever say, wow, look at all the candles you lit. <laughs> is it my birthday? No. <laughs> because here's the real question. Are you ready for the real question? Here's the real question. If I am falsely thinking that what I eat or don't eat makes me more or less right with God, or if I'm thinking that what religious thing I do will score me heavenly points, then who is really losing out? Me. God's not fooled by any of those things. I must be the one who's fooled by those things. Just religious routine, just activity, just forward momentum. That's not relationship with God. In fact, look in verse 18. Paul the Apostle knows it. He says, let no one cheat you of your reward. I'm going to get cheated out of a reward if I'm just moving forward in religious motion. Absolutely, I'm going to get cheated of what reward? Are we talking eternal rewards? Well, yeah, but I think more close to home in context here, the Apostle Paul is saying, you're going to miss out on a friendship with Jesus. Isn't that a reward? Is that a reward? You get to walk with him and talk with him every day. You get to be with Christ. You get to hear from him. You get to have him working on the inside of you, changing you from the inside out, making you more like him. Don't get cheated of that. Verse 18 continues. He's talking about folks here that have fallen into these traps, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Okay, you look at this and you think to yourself, all right, who's he talking about? Who, who are these folks, you know? Or who are these folks in our day today that he's talking about? I guess I would put this under the category of spirituality or pseudo spirituality. This might be somebody, you know, who comes to you out of the blue and says something like, well, I've always considered myself a spiritual person. I consider myself sensitive to spiritual things. And there's something that's a little bit polished about that. There's something that doesn't really say anything. <laughs> they may go on to say, I've had several experiences in my life. Things that I knew were angels or messengers from beyond or spirit beings. Paul the Apostle is saying right now, put on the brakes those folks are talking about things that they have no idea, that they have not seen, that they're making up. Paul says that's a false humility. Another definition of false humility is actually pride dressed up in humility. The spirituality is not about God, but it is centered on self. Now look, 
I know this whole uh, new agey kind of thing is uh, confusing. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, uh, I went on to some new age uh, blogs yesterday. I went on to look, go read through some new age sayings. And uh, this looks to me like the group that Jesus would say, ever learning and never coming to the truth. Ever accumulating possibilities and thoughts and hopes and dreams and perhaps and perchance and it might be and but never coming to the truth. Never coming to the truth of who God is and that we're all sinners and that we need a Savior. So that's kind of mixed up in there. In fact, if, if you, I don't recommend this, but <laughs> after a while I was kind of like, ah, I'm getting off of this page. You read a bunch of New Age quotes and they're like, they're like a mixture of part true and part lie. You go, well, that's kind of true. And then you go, oh, that one's not true at all. And you read another one and you go, wait a minute, it was Jesus who said that first part, but then you added a second part on there. That's not right. So it brings a whole lot of confusion, you know, where the Lord always cleans things up. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I mean, that's pretty clear. <laughs> I need Jesus. Why, why search for something? It also appeared to me that a lot of those thoughts, although some of them sound good, like you're going to develop your whole self and, and uh, you're going to uh, pursue something that will make you a greater person. But as I began to read those with that flavor, I thought to myself, oh, well, there you have somebody that's self-centered. That's self-centeredness. That, that's what the Bible teaches against. What? It's all about me. What I can do, where I can go, what I know, what have I, what have I experienced? And then if you go even deeper into it, it gets real strange, you know, with beings from other planets and a channeling, and you go, okay, well, this is really, it's, you kind of, I, I, I'll be honest with you, after I'd gone through some of this stuff, I felt like I'd been slimed. <laughs> I was like, okay, I need to get right back to the Word of God and get cleaned up, you know what I mean? So uh, I would not recommend gurus, new age, seances, Ouija boards, meditation, special spiritual insights, self-actualization, and here's the other part of it, that self is God. Uh, I read one, one of the quotes said something like, uh, the only light you need is the light within. Well, what does that mean? It may sound clever or something, but you kind of go, now wait a minute, let me think about this for a second. The only light I need is a light within. Well, what does the Bible have to say? The Bible says, thy word is a light to my path and a light to my feet. The word of God says that God is light. Okay, all right, let's just go for the Lord here, shall we? In fact, uh, there is a modern day proverb that covers this. Here it is. There are two rules in the universe. Number one, there is only one God. And number two, it's not you. <laughs> so Paul now lays it on the line. And what does legalism or false spirituality, what does it do to a person? Verse 19, here it is. And not holding fast to the head. That's Christ. Look, we're in times. We're in crazy times in the world, aren't we? Where you're going to have to put concerted effort into holding on to Christ. You're going to have to be conscious about this. Not just forward motion of religious duty, but you're going to have to say, Good morning, Lord Jesus. Good afternoon, Lord Jesus. Where are we going today, Lord? I'm going to stay connected to you. Because look what he says. These folks are not holding fast to the head. That's Christ. From whom all the body, that's the church, nourished and knit together 
the bodies to be knit together by joints and ligaments. I would take it, those are the leaders in the church, the servant leaders. Those are your ushers, your pastors, your teachers, your Sunday school teachers. They're the joints and the ligaments. And what happens when you're connected to the head? You grow with the increase that is from God. So I've either got that increased growth from God or I don't have it. The, these practices cut you off from Christ. How clear is that? There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. In fact, that's the picture I want you to carry with you when it comes to legalistic motions forward or when it comes to false spirituality. I want you to picture a headless body. That's the picture you should hold. Apart from Christ, you're spiritually dead. No sight, no hearing, no vision, no direction, no nourishment, no growth, no increase from God. That's what Paul is telling us. Look at verse 20. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, in other words, what he's saying here is, look, if you've already put faith in God through Christ, if you've already let go of this world, we're, Christian, where's your home? Heaven. Heaven's your home, not the world. You're not trying to get it all here. That wouldn't make any sense to try and get it all in this little space called time versus eternity that God is going to you know, develop with and, and give to us. We daily follow Christ. You know, do we have a legal relationship with God or do we have a love relationship with God? We have a love relationship with him, don't we? Verse 20. So since you've crossed that line, so to speak, verse 20 says, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? It's like that group that says, uh, you have to meet on Saturday. You have to worship God on Saturday, Saturday alone. I mean, if you want to worship on Saturday, worship on Saturday. Want to worship on Sunday, worship on Sunday. Want to worship on Monday, worship on Monday. You know, you have that freedom. But it's not like God hears better, His hearing is better on Saturdays, you know, than any other day. You know? And I find it interesting that very often those groups that say you have to meet on Saturday for worship, they, they don't follow any of the other festivals. They don't follow the new moons. They don't do any of the other law. They just pick that one. <laughs> it's interesting to me. Verse 22. Which all concern. Oh, verse 21 ends with do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. Which all concern things which perish with the using. According to the commandments and doctrines of men. In other words, the, these things don't last. There's no value in them. He's saying it makes your faith an outward game rather than an inward relationship. Paul seals the deal here. Let's keep it real with Christ. Verse 23. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom. Looks like that guy's pretty smart there. Who the, who's that guy who used to be on Larry King all the time? Deepak Chopra. Sometimes Oprah used to have a lot of New Age people on, right? And you go, wow, that guy sounds pretty smart, you know? But it totally eliminates God from the thing, and then you become God. It's just horrible. These things have an appearance of wisdom in self imposed religion, in false humility, <coughs> in neglect of the body. But they but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Okay, here's what this is saying. You can put every restriction you want on your outward activity. <coughs> but it doesn't change your thought life. You can impose upon yourself. You name it. Don't walk on the grass. <laughs> So you don't walk on the grass, but you think about what that feel like in your toes. And <laughs> you know, oh, I won't look over there. But your mind goes over there without you even looking over there. He 
You may look good on the outside, but on the inside, there's only one person who knows who you really are, and that's the Lord. Let me just here remind us of, of what I think we all know. Self-imposed religion is man trying to reach God, trying to justify himself by the keeping of a list of rules. Christianity, on the other hand, is God reaching down to man in love through Christ Jesus. Just God saying, you could never jump high enough to make it into heaven. But because I love you so much, I'll make it possible by reaching you through my son, Jesus. That's why Jesus looked at the Pharisees and he would always take them to task. He would say to them things like this, you observe these minute rituals, but inwardly you are a tomb filled with dead man's bones. He says you're whitewashed sepulchers. <coughs> On the outside, a whitewashed sepulcher looks pretty good. Clean and neat, marble, you know, nice wrought iron gates. But on the inside, it's dead people. <coughs> He's saying that all religious works end and amount to nothing. Let me end with this. Ray Steadman, one of my favorite authors, <coughs> he wrote the following. All of these errors have one thing in common. They lose Christ. If you fall into any you lose the vitality and vigor of your Christian walk. Life becomes dull and often desperate. Many Christians discover this has happened to them. What they need to do is return to Jesus. When these things take over here in this place, return to Him. We must take care that in every day we are in touch with our loving Lord and walking in fellowship with Him. He is the one who can develop the proper self-life and yet keep us from being captured by the great God of self. He will restore and comfort us when we fall and falter, fail and falter, and in submission to Him we will find the freedom we seek. So gang, don't just go through the motions. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for the church family. I ask now, Lord God, that you by your Spirit would confirm these things to our hearts. Holy Spirit, come and touch hearts this morning. Speak to us of your love and of the greatness of Christ. And how he is ours by faith. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your work on the cross for us. We want to follow after you. And not let go of you. Or lose sight of you. Please bless us, Lord. With your presence in our lives in everything. We love you. We thank you for your word and for this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody says.